This is chapter 11 and we're reviewing political parties. So the goals for learning are to explain the purpose of political parties and identify the two major political parties and then give reasons why minor parties are important to describe the functions of political parties and the party platform and then to name types of primary elections and describe national political conventions to explain how candidates campa campaign for office and to describe voting and the steps in the election process and last to explain the uses of the initiative and referendum which is very important so um, early forms of political parties began in the United States during colonial times. So there was this group called the Whigs, and they opposed the English king in Parliament. So this was during the time where Britain pretty much was dominating the United States. So the Whigs were really fighting for more independence from the king. Then there was this other group called the Tories, and they were really loyal to the government of England, and so they were pro a monarchy and the rule of Britain. But then after the colonists won the Revolutionary War, two other groups started to form and they had different political and economic beliefs. So there was the Federalist Party and they preferred a powerful central government. So they wanted the federal government to pretty much determine law and justice. And then there is this other group, this anti-federalist party, and they were really into um, more independent states where the states had more of a say and a less powerful government. So, you know, as the king was removed from power in the United States, these new kinds of beliefs started to develop and so in 1787 the Federalists held something called a Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia so again Constitution meaning what is our government going to be made up of there was a convention to start writing that out and then the Anti-Federalists were like whoa 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 we don't want to approve the Constitution you guys unless we add a Bill of Rights so the first ten amendments are the Bill of Rights and the Anti-Federalists were really concerned that the central government, if it were too powerful, would become autocratic or despotic or um, violating certain principles of freedom unless there was a Bill of Rights. So really these two, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, help shape our Constitution today and their differences really were important. They, they contributed to our Constitution. So I created another slide to review again because it's very important. This is what shaped our Constitution. These are our roots. So the political parties in the United States, after we won the Revolutionary War against Britain and we the, the colonial people were free from their determinations, two groups began to develop. The Federalist Party that supported a powerful central government and the Anti-Federalist Party. So in 1787 they're in Philadelphia and these two distinct groups meet up to come together and approve a constitution. Two main individuals represented each group. So the Federalists, there was Alexander Hamilton and then the Anti-Federalists were following Thomas Jefferson and I'll go more into detail next slide. So the first president was Federalist George Washington and this is how political parties began to develop. Um, the Federalists supported George Washington and John Adams so these two uh, were the first two presidents of the United States um, in 1800 the Federalists finally lost power when Adams was defeated by Thomas Jefferson who I mentioned in the prior slide was a, an anti-Federalist 
and his supporters took the name. They evolved. So at first he identified, Thomas Jefferson identified as an anti-federalist and wanted the Bill of Rights to be embedded in the Constitution. Well then their name changed to Democratic Republican Party. Democratic Republican. Um, and then they started to win the next few elections. So the country grew and it changed and so did the political parties. Um, so it was evolving and growing from its infancy. And the Federalist Party lost most of its members. So the Democratic Republican Party was changing and it began to split into two different parts. So then, you know, off, limbing off the Anti-Federalists, there's the Democratic Republican Party and then that started to limb off. So it's like this crazy tree and one part was led by Andrew Jackson and in the next, next slide I'll tell you what happened next. So as the country's political system started to evolve more and more ideas were building on top of themselves. New challenges started to arise so new parties began to develop and one of them was in 1827 Andrew Jackson left that Democratic Republican Party that limbed off Thomas Jefferson's original anti-federalist group and he felt that the party was being used for the good of rich people and now that sounds pretty familiar doesn't it well Andrew Jackson was really he was considered a man of the people he wanted to make sure that people the common people's voices were heard more in government decisions and that's a pretty idealistic and wonderful value his ideas founded the Democratic Party Okay, so at this time, the Democratic Party begins, and in 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected president. So now, after the Democratic Republican Party was moving along and creating these ideas and values, here comes Andrew Jackson, and now there is the birth of the Democratic Party. And then in eight in in, in in 1860, the Democratic Party was challenged by a party founded in 1854. Guess what it was called? It was the Republican Party. So it was almost like the split, the Democratic-Republican Party, just someone took an ax to it and split it apart. And at the time, Republicans re represented something completely different than it does today. After about 1932, Democrats and Republicans have been more balanced in their power, and they've elected about the same number of presidents. And so we've primarily become a two-party system, though there are many other parties in the United States. If you notice, if you look at the Senate or the House of Representatives, it's mostly two parties involved, the Democrat and the Republican. And now you notice that done a flip. The Democrats nowadays tend to be more liberal and the Republicans tend to be more conservative, whereas during the time of Lincoln, Republicans were more um, uh, liberal and Democrats were more conservative. And the push for stronger federal government during Lincoln's time was more of a Republican value. And why was that? How did it switch? Well, when Republicans had a platform during the 1800s, the late 1800s, they were anti-slavery at the time. And so Lincoln was heading the Republican Party. So they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and there was the 14th Amendment. The Department of Justice was created. These were things that the Democrats opposed at the time and so that kind of describes the values of the Republican Party. They, why they were pushing for a stronger federal government were for many reasons. There was something called the Homestead Act where they're trying to create more equal opportunity for people that own land and so that would require stronger federal power okay so then through the early 1870s the lines were pretty clearly drawn and 
suddenly in 1936 there's this election and we have Franklin D. Roosevelt winning re-election and making a promise of the New Deal which had to do with dealing with the fact that we were in a severe depression um, and this again expanded power well he was a Democrat and so federal power began to grow again but under a Democrat, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The New Deal brought about things like the California Conservation Corps is rooted in the New Deal, which was first the Civilian Conservation Corps. So unemployment and pensions for the el elderly were given relief because of the New Deal. Um, improvements to roads and infrastructures. So then there was again this shift and it flipped. The Democrats suddenly were becoming more pro-federal government having power and making determinations for the people. But as you notice, so parties can change over time and represent something different to the people. And that's important to know. So now the United States is primarily a two-party system where each party tries to get control of government. And so Great Britain and other nations also have a two-party system. So we're not the only one, but many countries like France have a multi-party system. And in a multi-party system, usually one party does not get control over the government. So there's a lot of varying ideas and values and platforms. Some minor parties join together to create what we call a coalition and that's when they each little party feels like they don't have enough power to really promote their ideas and get attention from the people. So they'll join forces if they have like values with other minor parties. Now many minor parties are created and it's because there's a lot of people out there who have very different political beliefs from those of Democrats or Republicans. And they have to be nominated by a particular party. For instance, the Libertarian Party. Um, so these candidates have little chance of being elected. It's, they, 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 what they want to do is influence the election outcome of the Democrat and Republican candidates. And it is possible for them to take votes away when the election comes along from one of the major candidates and actually affect the outcome. And, and so let me give you an example, though this was a long time ago. In 1912, there was a progressive party and they nominated Theodore Roosevelt as the third party candidate. Well, Roosevelt did not win but he took away these votes from this one man, William Taft. He was the Republican candidate. Well, because of that, the Democratic nominee, Woodrow Wilson, won. So most parties are, minor parties tend to be created more to promote ideas and get the people thinking about these new ideas. For instance, libertarians, they're in favor of a limited government. They don't want the government creating so many laws and getting involved in people's lives. The Socialist Party was organized in 1901 and that's another party, minor party and they really want group ownership and equal distribution of wealth. The Socialist Labor Party, they want workers to control businesses. They think those working the business should have a say. And then these three parties have never had a successful presidential candidate, but their ideas continue to be promoted and they continue to influence debates and the direction of platforms that are developed. So again, the American Independent Party is a minor minor party and it was formed in 1968 under a former governor of Alabama his name was George Wallace and he was he ran for president and then there in 1996 again in 2000 Steve Forbes he was a businessman a big-time businessman you've heard of Forbes magazine pr 
probably. He spent millions of dollars campaigning for president, and he was in favor of a flat tax. He thought everybody, no matter what your income, should pay the same amount of tax. He ended up dropping out of both campaigns. But the flat tax became uh, something to debate. So again, minor parties bring up new ideas. Whether they're agreeable or not is a whole other thing. Minor parties um, can hold beliefs that the major parties do not support. So they bring in beliefs to the attention of the major parties. Um, usually this happens when many citizens see the need for change. They start to support minor ideas and then those minor ideas start being picked up by major party candidates. So you might have been hearing me use the term platform quite regularly in this presentation and a platform is a statement of the ideas, the policies, the beliefs of a political party in an, an election. So political parties believe in certain policies and they try to present candidates who will support their beliefs. So let's go into more detail about what that looks like. Republicans, they usually are politically conservative. They believe in less government control and more individual responsibility. So when we talk about social welfare, for instance, they aren't really going to favor um, providing as many services. They think it should be an individual responsibility and so the social safety nets that are out there might be more limited under a Republican platform. Uh, so then when we move on to Democrats, they're more liberal. And so they tend to be less concerned about government control, for instance, providing more social services. Both parties have many of the same goals, but liberals tend to be more open to change. Um, and they both tend to have different ways of achieving those similar goals. So um, if you look on the right here of this PowerPoint, you can see it's divided between Republicans and Democrats. And under each one you can see how they feel generally about education, health care, social security, the war that we had in Iraq, and the Patriot Act. You can see generally what their beliefs are about these topics. Um, so those are the differences. So what is the party platform and then what other functions does a political party have? Well, political parties have a number of functions. They're most active during political campaigns in election years. So every four years they start kicking into gear. And between elections, political parties work to see that party incumbents will be reelected in the next election. So an incumbent is a person who holds an office. And political parties, they, they have to hold fundraisers. They need to make m mucho money. <laughs> because to, getting out into the media is costly. Advertising is costly. So they may also send out newsletters to constituents. And who are these constituents? Well, they're a member of an office holder's voting district. So uh, you know how we were talking a while back about districts. So these politicians are concerned about satisfying those that are in their voting district, whether it's you and I or someone else. And they tell them how the office holder is working to help these constituents. So these newsletters updates provide updates on what they're doing in the field to help those that are going to be voting for them. So what is an opposition party? <laughs> well, if you notice in the word op oppose is in opposition, so we've got a party, a party's candidate is in office 
and that party can be in power but then there's also a political party that does not have a majority in the government and that's the opposition party and when a party is not in power um, they watch very closely what those in power are doing and they they point out the changes that they could make that are different than what the party in power is doing and they suggest how it can be done so they hope that this will help their party in future elections by offering change Primary elections are very important because it's an election to choose candidates or select delegates to a party convention. And an election is held before the general election. The primary election, meaning the first election, is a way that political parties choose members of their party to run for public office in the general election. So what does this mean? Um, say you're part of a Democratic Party and there's Joe Bob who has been uh, a representative for a long time in California. Say he's uh, been very successful at promoting the Democratic beliefs. He's going to be part of the primary election. He could either be a delegate or a candidate. Now we're going to find out who the what I mean by delegate versus candidate because it can get kind of confusing. Um, many candidates may want to be nominated in a primary. So there's a lot of people who may be hoping to run for president. And sometimes it's someone who's already holding office like we were talking about. Uh, could be a representative or a senator. And only one candidate for, for an office from each party is chosen to run in a general election. Then in the general election, voters choose between the candidates who won the primary elections. So there's actually many elections that happen before we get to the general election. For instance, between Romney and Obama, there were many elections happening prior to that. So we're going to go over what these primary elections are. There's different kinds. There's something called a direct primary and I think I'll go into that in the next slide. So there are many different kinds of primaries depending on how they want to choose their candidates, how each party wants to choose them. So the form most often used that I mentioned earlier was is the direct primary and what that is is party members who wish to run for office ask to have their names put on a ballot and then the voters choose the candidate they support and there are two kinds of direct primary so there's all these different levels of primaries and under the direct primary there's two one called an open and the other a closed and when voters claim uh, to be a Democrat or Republican you'll see in the closed primary you're required to vote for a candidate under your party so you would only be able to choose those who are wishing to run for president under the Republican Party okay so that's called the closed primary so if you as a voter are identified as a Republican, you can only vote for candidates who are running for president under the Republican section. So these are primaries. This is before the general election where there are selected one candidate. Um, the open primary, on the other hand, has ballots of all the candidates no matter what party they belong to. So it doesn't matter if you're identified as a Republican, you can vote for both of the party candidates it depends on whichever one you think is best you don't have to identify specifically with the party um then okay so that we just talked about direct primaries but what about indirect primaries um indirect primaries are 
um, the the political party members elect delegates to party conventions. So we, the people, do not vote. It's the members of a political party. Um, they elect delegates, and this is where delegates comes in. These are politicians that are pretty much involved in, have been involved in lawmaking and working in the public domain, and they choose the candidates for us. So they're kind of like our representatives, and that's called an indirect. A nonpartisan primary, they are not connected to any political party. And it's generally used for smaller local elections. So voters consider a candidate's qualifications, and that's it. It's who cares about party. We want to vote on the context of so on the content of someone's character. What is a presidential primary? Well, some states use a presidential primary to select the delegates for the national convention. So, who are these delegates? Well, they, they are people involved in the political system who promise to support a certain candidate. For instance, maybe Romney's in the primaries and he's running and he's wanting to run against Obama because he's the opposition party. Well, these delegates um, listen to the candidates as they present at the national convention. So there's this huge convention. There's all these people coming in. Say they're all Republicans, and they're woo-woo, rah-rah. And they listen to these candidates, and they vote for those delegates. So I'm not talking about candidates. I'm talking about delegates who are going to vote for the candidate. Remember, there's an direct primary where the people vote and an indirect primary where the the delegates vote for us. They're like representatives. Um, so a similar method is the presidential preference primary. And in that primary, voters choose delegates in the same way. But the delegates do not have to support certain candidates. Now what does that mean? Say we're at the Republican convention and as a delegate you promise that you'll vote a certain way but it and, and maybe you're a delegate of Romney but say you just heard the speech of someone else another Republican candidate who wants to be given a chance to run against Obama you can, as a delegate, vote for that person instead. So there's a lot of layers to getting to the actual general election. There's election, pre-election elections and elections, and there's conventions. and So let's make sense of all this. Um, every four years, parties hold national conventions for president and vice president. And so, for instance, the Democrats, when Obama was running, he, he worked at developing the party platform. What does that mean? That, what are we going to believe as Democrats? What am I gonna, how am I going to answer these questions when I'm in front of the voters? How, how are we going to address certain issues, whether it's education, in, on international affairs, our budget, as Democrats? How are we going to uphold the values of the Democratic Party? So the delegates at these conventions every four years listen to the candidates and the delegates who in place of the people will vote for those who are going to run for president. Convention delegates are chosen in different ways. So we also choose the delegates. This just gets crazy. So. To choose those to choose president to run, the delegates state their presidential preference in the primary elections. And then state or district conventions, 
happen. And that's where delegates can be chosen, is at the state level or the district level in those conventions. And when I mean convention, I mean where they share, where they listen and share their beliefs and which candidate might uh, convey those beliefs in a way that's congruent with their own values, the delegates' values. So when we get even more into it, a delegate will have an alternate selected in case they can't vote. So a dele if a delegate is unable to vote, the alternate votes instead. And then uh, candidates already worked hard before the national convention, so they have c been campaigning across the country to win support of the delegates. So we're not even talking about the voters. This is an indirect primary, meaning the voters aren't choosing. So these conventions you see in this image here for Obama, all these people are delegates listening to Obama, and they're deciding, is this the one that's going to be our candidate? And this is before he was actually elected into office. Um, so these candidates work until the moment votes are cast, and they and they are trying to win the votes of these delegates. The successful candidate becomes a party's nominee for the national election for president. So a nominee is a person who has been chosen to run for election, and that's that's a big deal. So the keynote address, what is it? So after the national committee chairperson calls the convention to order, hear, hear, call to order, a speech is given and it's called the keynote address. It is a speech that presents the main issues of interest and promotes enthusiasm and party unity. So it's like a rah, 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 gets people really pumped. And this speech is made by an important party member who usually praises the party and asks everyone for cooperation and forecasts a victory in the coming national election. So I gave you an example here. This did happen for the Republican um, National Con or not the National Convention, but the um, National Committee chairperson. He said, our leaders today have decided it is important to be popular, to do what is easy and say yes, rather than to say no when no is what's required. So you can hear in Christie, he's asking for authenticity with his party, he's asking them to have a backbone and to say no when it's necessary. Um, and that's really what the convention is about in the keynote address is to get these values instilled in everybody and ask for cooperation. So this is how the national conventions are organized. I know you're dying to know. <laughs> the, there's four committees that help get it going. Um, the four committees organize and run the party's national convention, and so, of course, we start with the organization committee. And what they do is they select a chairperson who keeps everything organized, and then they also select a convention site. So where are we going to have this big party? <laughs> where are we going to share our ideas? So usually it's a big center, a convention center. And then there's a rules committee, and they set the rules for running the whole convention. There's the credentials committee, and they settle any disputes about which delegates from a state or territory may vote. So again, these are the, the delegates, the ones who vote for the candidate. Then there is the platform committee, and they develop and write the principles and policies for the party platform, meaning what are we going to, what values, beliefs are we going to promote, how are we going to address social issues, um, military issues, whatever comes up that year as a leading issue, they get everyone on the same page and 
how are we going to resolve these issues as a party with our beliefs? And so they write the platform. The committee members usually try to include the ideas and views of the person who is most likely going to be named the party's presidential candidate. And you usually get a feel for who's going to win. So, for instance, Romney for the Democratic Party, most likely they wrote these ideas and views shaped around what Obama really valued. And then, for same for Romney. His party developed a platform mostly centered around his values, although the overarching value would be those of the Republican Party. What happens when the National Convention kicks in? Well, there's an order to things. It begins with party leaders' speeches. So again, the rah, 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 this is what we're going to do. This is what we believe in. Let's cooperate. Um, and then the first party chairperson calls the roll to begin voting. So this is, we're still talking about primaries here. So this is before the actual general election, okay? They're still trying to pick which candidate is going to be representing the party. Um, so when they, what do I mean call to roll? Well, it's when they start putting in their votes. And if no majority vote happens, a second ballot is called. Usually the first time around a majority vote has occurred and the delegates um, have chosen. For instance, in this case, they chose Obama for the Democrats. Well, the presidential candidate is then named. And he, and this, he or she meets with advisors and they choose the vice president that's going to run alongside the president. And, um, you know, they chose Biden because he was the second most popular. So they try to choose a vice president. Usually it's the second runner. And then in this convention it ends with an acceptance speech it usually moves everybody and everyone's pumped and here's an excerpt from Obama's acceptance speech he said you and I as citizens have the power to set this country's course so he's basically saying power to the people you have a chance to change the direction of our country so the key word that in this national convention is roll call and that's when you call off the name of each state so the chairperson whoever it is that's running the whole national convention would say Alabama and so the delegates in Alabama would name who they think the candidate for president should be so they do that and then the majority again the majority person wins and that would have been Obama in this case Okay, we're going to be completely switching gears now. Um, we're going to be talking about referendums, which I have to tell you, it's incredibly important to understand because this has to do with voting. And in addition to voting for candidates for public office, citizens may also vote on certain issues. Issues, not just candidates but issues so their votes can create new laws we can create new laws coming together so there's three main referendums and what is a referendum it's an act of submitting a matter to a direct vote and whenever you hear the word direct it means of the people from the people the people directly influence the decision so these three kinds of referendums you will see on a ballot if you choose to vote. So after the state legislator passes a law, citizens may protest the law. They might not like it. If enough people sign the petition, it's called a petition referendum, and it will be placed on the ballot. So just because the legislator has passed a law, it does not mean it's fixed. The people can fight against it. There's also something called an optional referendum. And so this happens in some states where the legislator may refer a proposed law to the public for acceptance or rejection. Okay, so rather than legislator kicking that law into gear, they might decide on their own. It's an option. Remember, optional. 
they might decide, you know, we really want the people to make this decision. We created this law for a reason, but let's refer it to the public. So they do it willingly. And usually the referred proposed law is one that is uh, disputed amongst most people. It's, it's um, something that really they want the people to decide. Then there is the compulsory referendum. And some state laws require certain issues to be sent to the voters for their approval or rejection. An example is to change the state constitution, being that that's such a serious decision, they, most states you have to ask for the voters to choose or reject the change. Delaware is the only state that does not need public approval to change its constitution. Okay, so that's how serious it is. And compulsory means mandated, forced, required. So compulsory referendum means legislators have to ask voters. Okay, so this is the last slide and then you'll do your review. And this is so important, initiatives. This is really power of the people right here, not just voting, but initiating. In some states, citizens can suggest a new law to be presented to voters. This is called an initiative or a proposition, and you've heard of the many kinds of propositions. Um, a petition must be signed by a certain number of people before the initiative or proposition can be voted on by the legislators or by voters. If a majority are in favor of the law, it goes into effect, simple as that. So um, the thing about initiatives, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but sometimes when you go shopping, there'll be someone standing outside asking you if you vote, if you're a registered voter, and they'll introduce an initiative to you. I suggest you really stop and take the time to listen to what that initiative is. I tend to sign them whether I'm for it or against it just to get it on the ballot because when you sign uh, a petition for an initiative to be voted on it doesn't mean you're actually voting for the initiative yet until you are until it's election time when you sign a petition you're saying please put this out there for people to vote on so you will encounter that at times. Uh, now let's move on to recall. This is another power of the people. Someone can be removed from office if they get a large enough number of signatures. Again, it's called a petition. And the people who are petitioning meet all the certain legal requirements that are laid out. And then the recall issue is placed on a ballot. So if a majority of voters are in favor of the recall, the elected person has to get out of office. They must leave. And usually, if this were to ever happen, and rarely it does, it's because the official, the elected official is accused of a crime, like stealing public funds and using it for personal reasons. Um, <laughs> most likely, that's the case.